Good afternoon. afternoon. Squaring the ethical circle, Zornir Hersing as a doer of justice. My guess is that some of you are slightly puzzled, questionably intrigued, somewhat baffled or caught in an intellectual quandary when you both read and heard the title of my lecture, Squaring the Ethical Circle. Others of you may wonder, given the power of differentials that exist among various social strata, if the title of my lecture is a semantic paradox or some kind of mathematical ambiguity or just a mixed up, shook up verbal quibble that aimlessly muddles and befuddles the brain. A few sisters and brothers in the audience upon hearing the phrase squaring the ethical circle may question whether or not it is humanly possible to square ethics in the same way we square a number by multiplying that number times itself. One or two among us may even chuckle to ourselves at what sounds like a preposterous, simple-minded, inconsistent absurdity, not only to talk about squaring a circle, but to indicate that African-American scholars in religious studies who identify ourselves as womanists are naming and claiming sufficient intellectual rigor for critiquing ethical discernments and moral agency, so much so that we're using womanist synergy to convert the contours of round wheels on enclosed curves into hypercubes, four-dimensional convex squares with equal sides of equal length with opposite equal angles. In other words, those of us who do liberation ethics, our work consists of debunking, unmasking, and disentangling ethical dilemmas. We maintain that in order for us to be true to the work we're called to do, we must critically construct and cogently articulate contestable dilemmas embedded in our existential realities. We cannot afford to hide behind detached, abstract screens of disinterested explorations. Nor can we pretend as if we're working in a space of fixed ideas of dispassionate objectivity that circumnavigates at a given distance from a disembodied point which supposedly gives all of us the exact same range of freedom and options of choice in relation to a static, fixed, stationary center. Well, the title for this lecture, Squaring the Ethical Circle, is an improvisational composition based on a story wherein I take the interacting and intersecting axis of race, sex, and class and put it together in a balancing geometric force moving in and moving out, multi-layering and mediating one another, so much so that the intrinsic connections of race, sex, and class run together and converge against the backdrop of Southern social political culture. And in turn, the interdependency of race, sex, and class end up being a multi-textured point of departure for well-grounded ethical analysis. So our story for this afternoon begins like this. At 11.34 a.m. on Sunday, August 3rd, in the year 1952, four shots were fired in Live Oak, Florida, a prosperous farming town full of tobacco growers and folks working in the timber industry. Live Oak, Florida is a community center located between Jacksonville and Tallahassee is a town bordered on the west by 85 miles of the lazy, winding river celebrated in the song, Swanee River. As a result of the four shots that were fired, Dr. Clifford Leroy Adams, Jr. became the most prominent white man ever slain by a black woman in the southern part of the United States. It is not Dr. Adams' story that I'm concerned with in this lecture, however, but the story of the woman, Ruby, Jackson McCullen, the woman who fired the 32 caliber nickel-plated Smith and Weston pistol. We have Ruby McCullen's story because of the work of Zora Neale Hurston in reporting the McCullen trial for the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. Hurston's coverage of the bench rulings and the court protocols of the McCullen trial show us how one woman's strategic use of another woman's context, circumstances, and conditions 
were used in the fight for justice in the 1950s. Furthermore, Zorina Hurston was the most prolific black woman writer in the United States between 1925 and 1960. Hurston was an essayist, a short story writer, and an anthropologist. All in all, Zorina Hurston published four novels, two books of folklore, an autobiography, numerous short stories, and essays. Though she was never able to gain permission to interview Ruby McCullen, Hurston knew that Ruby McCullen's struggle to be saved from the death in the electric chair needed to be exposed to the eyes of a whole lot of people. To make this point another way is to say that Zorner Hurston squared the ethical circle by enabling us to exegete how race, sex, and class against the backdrop of Southern culture opens up one of the most famous murders in American history. Hurston's account of the Ruby Jackson McCullen trial is a cautionary tale. There are few scholars who think of the trial of Ruby McCullen as a modern day parable interrogating complex interracial relationships. However, as a womanist liberation ethicist, I find this story to be a moral caveat, full of life lessons, an ethical exemplification that reaches out in compelling and instructive ways. Hurst's narrative places in dramatic relief not only the inconsistencies in the trial itself, a trial that shook the foundation of racial segregation, but Hurston's moral agency invites each of us to wrestle with what it means in our own individual lives to create justice-making possibilities in the midst of our existing social order. It is essential to keep in mind that the Pittsburgh Curia, formally incorporated on May 10, 1910, was a nationally distributed weekly newspaper. Its pages addressed the cultural milieu and the social political issues of fundamental import to black communities all across this country, from coast to coast, from the Atlantic to Pacific Oceans. Overall, what is embedded in this narrative is Hurston actualizing her commitment as a doer of justice. In a sensitive reading of Hurston's biography, we discover that Hurston was employed by the Pittsburgh Courier to cover the McCullen trial during a period in Hurston's own life when she was plagued by health problems, including a tropical virus she contracted during, drinking impure water during one of her numerous trips in the Caribbean. And yet Hurston fought to save Ruby Jackson McCullen from the electric chair at a time in her own life which was full of dire financial circumstances. So much so that Zorner Hurston declined an invitation in the 1950s to speak at a forum in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, because she didn't even own a winter coat. So let us keep in mind that this Margaret L. Sorensen lecture is about a black and white murder in the state of Florida. And that I'm delivering this lecture at a time when daily legal drama continues to unfold and public inter interpretations of events continue to surface regarding the horrific and tragic murder of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. So as you follow along with me this afternoon, you may hear a subtext of established patterns of power, principalities, and spiritual weakness. They may resonate with time and location, meaning and memory, the Zorna Hurston excavated in the cultural context of the Reuben McCullen trial more than 60 years ago. First and foremost, if we're serious about squaring the ethical circle, we must demythologize the social legitimacy of white supremacy. Demythologize the social legitimacy of white supremacy. Hurston understood the seriousness of this first mandate that if we desire to live an authentic, trustworthy, responsible uh, lifestyle, that we find ourselves in situations where every injustice is the order of the day, then we must do something to change it. In Hurston's distinct voice and powerful prose, she wrote 20 stories beginning October 1952 until May 1953 for the Pittsburgh newspaper. 
It's important for us to grasp the fact that the trial of Reuben McCullen takes place within a historical time period when numerous changes were occurring in African American life. This story occurs during the time between World War, World War II and the Korean War. It takes place when Marion Anderson sang at the Lincoln Memorial for 75,000 people after her concert at Constitutional Hall was prevented by the daughters of the American Revolution. It was during a time when Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as president, issued an executive order forbidding racial and religious discrimination in the government training programs and defense industries. And yet within the same time period, white mob violence, bloody race riots, and hate strikes broke out in northern and southern cities alike. Looming large in the social, cultural, historical backdrop of the 1950s is a legacy of lynching. At least 5,000 African Americans have, Americans have been lynched in the USA uh, in the past 50 years. Lynching occurred approximately every two and a half days. As a matter of fact, the Tuskegee Institute reported that 1952 was the first year in 71 years of tabulation that there was no lynching in the United States. In the 1950s, racial segregation in public and private facilities meant no matter how heavy our bodies were with fatigue, we could not obtain lodging in the motels along the highway, nor in the hotels in the cities. Like detectives, African Americans had to discern gigantic as well as minute extensions of the social framework of racism, even to the point of deciding at which gas station we could refuel, making sure we never risk acting in any way that might be detrimental to the health and safety of our family members. This cluster of racial etiquette was traumatic. And if we are serious about demythologizing the social leg leg legitimacy of white supremacy, then each of us must do a rigorous self-inventory of our experiences as embodied racial people. As for me, a person who was born in the year of 1950, I grew up in a culture that declared it was against the law for black children to play in tax-supported public parks. It was against the law for us to skate in tax-supported public rinks. It was against the law for us to swim in tax-supported public pools. In the landscape of the 1950s, to swing on swings, to slide down slides, to build sand castles in the sandboxes where white children played would result in swift punishment. Even though my classmates and I sang all the verses to the song, my country tears of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. We had to remain self-consciously aware that it was against the law for us to go to the public library. Nor could we borrow a book from the white side versus the Negro side of the teeny tiny bookmobile that travels monthly throughout the rural areas of my hometown in Cabarrus County, North Carolina. It was even a transgression at the tender age of eight for me to sign up for the Kannapolis citywide spelling contest. As survivors of the nightmare of the separate but unequal school system, African American children used the discarded books from the white schools three years after the students threw them away. We used their musical instruments, school desks, chemistry set, microscopes, and other lab equipment at least five years after they were salvaged from the storage warehouse trash bins. So complete was the circle of segregationist laws, the rigidly enforced codes of white supremacy, that walking through the door of the YWYMCA for after school programs was a matter of life and death. The power broker's collusion with lawless vigilante groups, such as the Klan and the White Citizen Council, was a grim reality. Far too many of this nation's religious leaders, university professors, local, state, and federal politicians, the moguls of the media world, those who make up 39% of the population, yet hold 95% of top jobs in all sectors of society. They moved into the shadows of alleyways and side streets, while the lynch mobs, using the rawest of violence, boldly paraded through the main arteries downtown. Often, far too often, 
the rigid adherence to racism double bookkeeping classified black people as the last hired and the first fired. This unbridled exploitation of black women, black men, and black children in a capitalist political economy degrades and assigns people of African descent to work that is marginal, work that is low paying, work that is physically hazardous, work that is frequently seasonal, stagnant jobs, and declining industries. Thus, racial tensions have become more compounded as we as a nation have moved from segregation to desegregation to resegregation. So with this historical social culture framework in place, we can now move to our second point relevant to squaring the ethical circle, which is we must resist capitulation to the demands of a sexualized status quo. Resist capitulation to demands of a sexualized status quo. Hurston exposed insidious assumptions that reinforce inequalities between women and men due to the ethos, the pathos, and the theos of white supremacy. Racialized sexism can be found throughout the details of Hurston's narrative. Shortly after the shooting at 11.34 a.m. on Sunday, August 3, 1952, Ruby McCullum was hustled out of Live Oak, Florida on the heavy police guard before a hastily formed angry mob of more than 100 people could grab her. 45 minutes later, 20 patrol cars, each carrying two state troopers, followed the Swanee County Sheriff, Mr. Sim Howes, and delivered Mrs. McCullen unharmed to the Rayford prison. Ruby's husband, Sam McCullen, a tobacco farmer, a successful insurance agent, a construction worker, worker and a gambling kingpin left town with three of the children. They were daughter, Kay McCullen, 11 years old, Sonia McCullen, seven years old, and 15-month-old Loretta Jackson Adams McCullen. Ruby McCullen said that the white doctor, Leroy Adams Jr., was the father of her 15-month-old child and that she was pregnant by the doctor the second time at the time of the shooting. Ruby's son, 19-year-old Sam McCullen Jr., was attending college on the West Coast at UCLA. His matriculation at UCLA, UCLA in 1952 is an indicator of the McCullen family's affluent status at the time of the shooting. The strain of the tragedy was too great for senior Sam McCullen. When he arrived at the home of Ruby's mother in another part of the state of Florida, Sam McCullen suffered a fatal heart attack. He died on Monday, August 4th, one day after the shooting. When the white people in Live Oak heard the news that Sam McCullen Sr. had dropped dead from a massive heart attack, a group of the local townsmen insisted on seeing Sam's body stretched out on the cooling board at the colored funeral home before they would believe that Sam McCullen was truly dead. One of the operating racist myths prevalent during this time was that black folk like to fake our death. We like to often play possum, pretending to be dead when we are not. To probe the connection between the murder of Dr. Adams on Sunday and the sudden death of Ruby's husband Sam on Monday, the story in the newspaper paints the following portrait. Exhibit A. Exhibit A is a five foot, one inch, 37 year old, soft-spoken black woman who was trained as an educator, mother of four, the wife of the wealthiest black man in Live Oak, Florida, who in 1952, their estate was worth more than $200,000. Exhibit B. Exhibit B is a fat, pot-bellied, six-foot, two-inch tall, 270-pound, 44-year-old white physician who has just been elected by a landslide in the Florida Senate and was now considered to be the most famous, the most powerful, and the mo most beloved man in Suwannee County, Florida. Most significantly, we see the contours of Hurston's agenda when we lay side by side racist myths about black sexuality and the ideology of slavery, wherein the white male subject at the center of power literally control the female body. Hurston's narrative invites us to wrestle with a series of ethical questions, 
For instance, what are the real life consequences when women resist the complex baggage of racist projections and sexual fantasies, fantasies under which we're forced to live? How should we respond to social realities that situate African American women not only as a second sex, not only as members of the last race, not only as marginalized and deviant, but what acts of justice are required of us when women of African ancestry are presented and represented throughout societal institutions as the quintessential site of difference? Although a character portrait of Dr. Adams is beyond the scope of this lecture, it is important to note that Dr. Adams was running a scam against the Blue Cross Insurance Company. Dr. Adams forged his name as a benefactor on several white men's insurance policies. And it was said that Dr. Adams could cause the death of a few white women due to botched abortions. So let us continue the ethical question emerging from this story. Did Dr. Adams have Sam McCullen's future in the palm of his hands? With a grip so tight that Sam could not squawk about anything the doctor did? no matter what it was in terms of including Ruby to be his mistress? Is it true that Sam McCullen came home earlier than expected one day and found Dr. Adams in his bed in his house? And in turn, did Sam threaten to shoot Ruby if she gave birth to another white baby? While at the same time, Dr. Adams was threatening to kill Ruby if she terminated the pregnancy, having conceived the second child with Dr. Adams? Does sexual intimacy negate racial bigotry? Is it realistic to assume that African females can claim bodily integrity peacefully? Are there parts of the word no that men do not understand? Or must women kill in order for our no to be understood? Few African Americans of my generation can forget that an indelible character mark in race relations was defined by white men who wielded an inordinate amount of power, and these men entered the black community with the assumption that any female was available for their possession. Nor can my generation forget that survival, survival demanded that no black man, woman, or child could say or do anything against such racist sexual assumptions. This illicit practice was an unwritten antebellum law that declared a white man's right to a black woman's body whether she was married or not. So we can see why the vast majority of African Americans across the country eagerly followed the McCullen trial in the weekly issues of the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. Because in many forms and fashion, they applauded the courage of this black woman, Ruby Jackson McCullen, who dared to defy the white man's self-appointed sexual prerogatives. In essence, a second lesson in Herson's ethical praxis of resisting capitulation to the demands of a sexualized status quo is interlocked with our previous action of demythologizing the social legitimacy of white supremacy. In the American South, the cultural capital of sexualized white supremacy squares the circle this way. Southern whites don't care how close blacks get as long as we don't get too high. Northern whites don't care how high blacks get as long as we don't get too close. Now the third and final lesson pertinent to squaring the ethical circle is dealing with the blood sport of systemic injustice. Dealing with the blood sport of systemic injustice. In Hurston's newspaper reports, we encounter a notoriously unfair trial. Hurston's investigation documents one unsuspecting cruel sucker punch to the heart of the black community over and over again. For instance, Hurston points out that the trial judge, Judge Hal Adams, no blood relation to the slain doctor, Clifford Leroy Adams, but the judge who was the trial judge was an honorary pallbearer at Dr. Adams' funeral. With clarity and directness that one associates with prophetic utterances, Hurston goes out of her way to critique with perfect candor the judge's single criterion for mental competence. Does Ruby McCullough know right from wrong? Judge Adam never asked whether it's ever right for a black woman to kill a white man. 
is it always wrong, no matter the circumstances? For all of Judge Adams' self-proclaimed position of high moral ground, Judge Adams dispensed with McCullen's First Amendment rights, announced that he did not want tedious, lengthy, technical testimony. He wanted reasonable progress during the trial, and he wanted only non-expert witnesses. There was a complete refusal on the part of the court to admit any testimony that might have spotlighted the sexual relations between Reuben McCullen and Leroy Adams. Indeed, in almost every instance, Judge Adams sustained the state's objection that Reuben McCullen's six-year association with Dr. Adams was irrelevant and immaterial to the present issue. Judge Adams ruled out any testimony regarding the doctor's association with Reuben McCullen other than as a private patient and physician. McCullen's defense team complained that the court refused to admit testimony concerning the birth certificate for the 15-month-old baby of Reuben McCullen, which he said was fathered by Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams even signed his name on the birth certificate of the baby as the father of, Ruby Mc of, of Loretta McCullen. Nor would Judge Adams allow the baby, Loretta Jackson Adam McCullen, who was present in the courtroom to be viewed by the jury. The judge would not permit any description of the biracial child to enter the record. In addition, in this line of bizarre absurdity, the ju jury was not allowed to hear testimony of the maltreatment of Reuben McCullen or any altercations between McCullen and Adams, how Dr. Adams would hit, slap, and shake her at various times. Nor could the jury hear how Dr. Adams would tear into Ruby like a lion, and then he would inject her with shots of B12 vitamins laced with morphine. As I mentioned earlier, Zornia Hurston never got to talk face to face with Ruby McCullen because Judge Adams denied all members of the press access, access to the defendant. So what Hurston decided to engage in was both a horizontal and vertical exploration. Even though the trial judge said there would be no outside interference in his effort to assure a quiet and orderly trial, Hurston understood that Judge Adams had no power over the avalanche of images and speculations of the people who lived around Live Oak, Florida. So Hurston canvassed the neighborhood. She asked one basic question. What made Ruby McCullen kill Dr. Leroy Adams? Some folk replied that Ruby was a jilted lover. She had given birth to the doctor's daughter and was once again pregnant, two months pregnant, and was now being cast down by the doctor, kicked to the curb because he had, been, he had won election to the Senate. Others said that Ruby was a scorned woman, had a scorned woman syndrome, with hell has no fury implications. Others said that she was a hypochondriac. Nobody talked about the possibility she could have been addicted to the morphine. She was caught in an intimate triangle of fear. Hurston's vertical investigation meant that she called in William Bradford Bowie, a journalist, to come in, a southerner who was known for anti-segregation, anti to talk to the white people about the case. As the trial continues to find, we find out that on that fateful Sunday morning, August 3rd, 1952, Ruben McCullen had gone to Dr. Adams' office for medical treatment. The doctor had asked her to render some sexual favors. She told the doctor, no, my arm is hurting. They got into, the doctor got, became enraged. She produced a pistol. She said they struggled, the gun went off. She said she doesn't remember anything else, even though she shot him four times. Furthermore, in dealing with a blood sport of systemic injustice, we discovered that the trial happened directly across the street from the doctor's office. They wouldn't even change the venue. Hurston says, well, what happened to all the other people? Where were the white women in this network of trauma? She says, some were knitting. Some had the children in the courtroom and some sat on the front row watching everything that happened. In the closing moments of the case, the state failed to prove first degree murder against, the defense failed to prove first degree murder against their client. The state had not proved premeditation. 
the defense attorney asked for a second degree verdict. However, December 27, 1952, Ruby McCullen buried her soul in order to save her life. She was convicted by a jury of her peers, all white males, two alternates. Six of the jurors had been members, six of the jurors' families had been members, six of the jurors' members had been patients of Dr. Adams. Hard to believe, isn't it? Well, sisters and brothers, we have the testimony. What does it mean for us to live as doers of justice? What must we do when we hear voices crying from the ground? Our moral imperative is to square the ethical circle unless evil is named, confronted, and eradicated, we will be destroyed. Thank you very much. <laughs>